as we know that most of them, all of the women, work in care work during the day in hospitals and even in the evenings in clinics. Some are social workers doing social, essential social work services, which means that also the majority of the time of their work, some who are also workers and cleaners are not at home uh, during the day in this lockdown and are leaving their children in their with their abusive partners who not only who would not have been with them at home which was not for the lockdown and the only protection for these children is a community together to ensure this further women are involved in informal businesses and have raised families and educated their children selling in our street corners. This provides economic independence for them and not on the music partners. But this lockdown has taken away from them and find themselves in dire straits. The government is trying to listen to them as far as South Africa is concerned and try and intervene where we can through different initiatives that are led by the president and his cabinet. Therefore, as we dialogue, let us together come up with solutions and not start blaming each other as no one could have anticipated that while we were putting systems to, in place to deal with this uh, gender-based violence crisis as a national uh, strategy plan uh, has been approved and uh, starting a process of putting the council in place. Then we have to deal with this virus that have the potential of wiping out the whole uh, community and delaying to act on the, these dire consequences that the whole world is faced with. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for, for your input. Uh, I, I'm not going to open for uh, questions. I'm now going to ask the Deputy Minister of the Department of Women, Youth and Persons with Disability to also make her input. Uh, then we, we will take it from there. Deputy Minister. Okay, thank you very much. I would also like to thank you very much, Mabato, and to greet all the uh, women who have joined us in looking at where we are today and where we want to be tomorrow. I must say, before I go to a subject matter quickly, thank you very much, Minister, uh, for the, the leadership you have provided up to today when it's really happening. Thank you, Mabato, as well, and all other colleagues who uh, contributed, particularly the UN Women in South Africa. Just if I may take from where the Minister left, I just want to ask to look at whether are there any lessons that we have learned which will take forward our struggle during this COVID-19? For me, that will be the most important things, but the thing to, to look at at the end. I'm saying that because within a period of two weeks, we've seen in South Africa a, a huge number of women being able to access water from the taps that have been dry for too long. And we're all talking about access to water, the right to access and so on. But in this instance, we saw it happening. So it's one lesson I want to take within my heart and say beyond this lockdown and the COVID-19 horror, we should work at a pace that we have never uh, worked at before. And of course, in the context uh, of webinar, it's important to, to say we need to really appreciate all the frontline 
fighters of this war. Uh, I remember recently when the MEC in KwaZulu Natal decided to do door to door to 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 access communities uh, and talk to families and screen and test. And again, you know what shocked me or struck me was the number of women who were out there in the forefront uh, without even sufficient protection. But since doing that door to door, actually talking to people, facing the, the, the Cold War and assisting our communities to take them out. So it's something which we should always remember that when it's a wartime, it's not uh, those in blue uniform, men and women, but it's really our ordinary people who sacrifices a lot. As the minister said, she mentioned social workers. I saw a lot of nurses uh, and those who were providing mental health support and just being out there with the communities in ways that are unusual on a daily basis when things are normal. But also, you know, we, we have used words of being shocked, uh, the incidents of gender-based violence during COVID-19. In our case, I think in South Africa, we felt it more because we thought 2018, 2019, early 2020, we have made lifetime strides. We have taken steps that and, and thinking that we won't regress easily again. So when we had the Minister of Police expressing concern about the number of calls to our police stations, one took that breath of a cold feeling of almost saying, oh, now it means we've lost some gains. But I must say, we have been out there, watchful and vigilant, uh, with the support of uh, civil society, I, I think our presence has been felt. When I say us, I don't mean as government, I mean as women activists and feminists, we have been communicating, a fight has been on, which I think is a good thing. We must appreciate that even in the context of uh, COVID-19, women continue to say, not in our lifetime enough is enough about gender-based violence and femicide. Uh, the other point which I think I wanted to flag quickly, uh, Mabato, if you can still allow me, is really our effort, especially as the de department and the sector, to look at the Disaster Management Act and to come up with directions which talk to the rights, the inclusive rights, of persons with disability. With all which have been said and done, we felt in the department under the leadership of the minister that we need to take an extra mile and to talk about the protection of persons with disability, uh, which I think we can all utilize now to make claims in terms of their rights how they should be protected during this time, access to hygiene tools that we all talk about, assistance uh, to make sure that the social distancing and all w what they will need uh, post-COVID-19 at the time when we are looking at another war of economic uh, recovery and the stimulation of the economy. So in uh, this discussion, I'm really looking forward to it. It will empower us a lot as we plan for life beyond COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, DM, for, for your contribution. I'm now going to ask uh, Ms. N. Gisuku Shongwe, the UN rep, uh, or the agenda, to make an input. N. Thank you so much, Ms. Mabatu. Thank you, Minister and uh, Deputy Minister. I really appreciate this partnership. Um, I speak here on behalf of the UN um, Gender Leadership Group and team that we have across the UN. And uh, Dr. Nados Bekele-Thomas uh, would have wanted to be with us, but she's not available today. 
but she asked me to convey her greetings to, to you, Minister and Deputy Minister, and to all the women who are in the room. Um, really just to reinforce the message that you have heard both from um, the Secretary General and from our Executive Director, Dr. Pumzile Mlambo Nguka, who um, across the world have been really calling on countries to focus their attention very specifically on what we are calling the shadow uh, pandemic. And the shadow pandemic is, um, in this instance, uh, gender-based violence happening, in particular intimate partner violence, and the fact that we are locked in with our, our uh, many women are locked in with their abusers. Um, and I think that the minister and deputy minister have both made reference to that. So I don't want to talk too much about that other than to share that across the world, we are seeing these numbers grow, and it doesn't matter which region it is, but we are seeing between 30 to even 200 percent growth in the number of calls that uh, command centers or helplines are receiving across the world in terms of domestic violence in particular. But I do want to share that there are interesting different practices that are emerging during this time, which might be interesting to think about. And one of them, which I've been talking about in our group, has been that actually uh, in Italy right now, they are pushing that it is men who are leaving the households in the event of abuse rather than women having to leave their homes. Um, and they're going into some kind of semi-correctional uh, facility so that uh, if there's a protection order issued, men leave and not Absolutely. women having to leave to go into shelters, which is, a, which is a, you know, it's just, it's just, a, it's just an example for, from, from one or two countries. So, but the issue of, of focusing on violence is a, is a really, really big one. And it's not just about the fact that we need to be able to be responsive, but it's also the economic cost of violence at this time and the fact that it is really um, diverting public funds to, to have to focus on this issue um, at a time when we have to focus it on health. So that's one big area. I think the other one that we need to talk a lot about is the issue of the economic impact, the socioeconomic impact, and the fact that in all our the work that we've been doing across um, the world, we are seeing an impact on women businesses, both in the formal and the informal sector. And I think in this country, one of the things that I know that uh, different um, UN partners have been working with the government has been on how do we make sure that we are identifying those, econ those businesses, first of all, that can provide essential services and can be prioritized for preferential procurement, mm -hmm. but also trying to make sure that we are connecting them to the relief and stimulus programs that exist um, on the ground already in the country. So that's one whole set of work which I think is critical for us to continue to work very closely and watch very closely. The other one which is very important is the informal sector. In most countries in the world, the informal sector is anywhere from 30 percent to 60 percent of the, those who are economically active. Um, we are finding now that even though we have relief and some stimulus uh, programs that have been put on the ground, I don't think we, ha we have yet uh, been able to reach many of the women um, who are very disadvantaged. And this is a, con a combination of domestic workers and uh, informal traders, whether hawkers, women who work in, in farms all over the country and are really a crucial part that we need to pay attention to. And from food to income, um, and again, across the world, this is exactly what we are seeing, and we're calling on governments to really focus attention on this issue. In this country, we cannot deny the focus on, on women who are living with HIV, um, because this is a very crucial group in this country. We have a, a close to 8 million people living with HIV, easily 2 to 2.5 million of, of those do not have access to ARVs or are not on ARVs, and so they are particularly vulnerable. So just as the, the, the Minister was, of Health was sharing that we should be protecting our elderly, I think we also need a really specific focus on people living with HIV, especially those who are not on ARVs, um, to make sure that, that they're not made more vulnerable and that they, are ha they have food. Um, and so as we look at vulnerability uh, assessments to identify who gets food first and who gets support first, let's make sure that we're really looking at those triple, uh, quadruple threats uh, that look, you know, for, for, for women, vulnerability to violence, vulnerability with HIV, looking at uh, their economic context and so on. So that's one other big area. I think this issue of the Disaster Management Act is a very important one, and we are very keen to support you and work with you 
to really assess how the, how every single regulation in that disaster management act impacts on women and how do we make sure that women in all their diversity are really uh, there's real attention that goes there and that we're not driving deeper vulnerability inadvertently as we focus on health obviously the focus on women in the health sector is a big one and women who are providing essential services everywhere in the world we see between 60 to 70 percent of those who are providing essential services are women even though for the first time this is a disease that is impacting on men more than it is with women in terms of morbidity and mortality but in actual fact we still are finding that the socioeconomic impacts are larger on women and so these are really critical areas i think the last one is about human rights violations and we are watching very closely what's happening because with the lockdown, we've got the, you know, there's a militarization and policing and, and in general around, around the world, this is a big, big issue. We're finding that human rights, uh, you know, are sort of pushed to the side as, as the military seek to create order. And I think this is something that is really important that we um, pay attention to and make sure that uh, women are not more vulnerable or that in fact our military and our police are really, really conscious of human rights and not treating, mistreating people in their eagerness to, to control crowds. Um, cyber violence, we just, we just experienced that today and really apologize for that. This is a, a, a verified uh, UN account that was hacked, one that we had actually um, had protection. So it's very interesting that I think Obviously, if you send Zoom messages in advance, people have a chance to prepare themselves. And the fact that this was an actual meeting on women and GBV as well is very, very concerning that there was an attempt really to, to hack and, and disrupt this meeting. So I'm so glad that you, many of you just stayed in there, hanging in there, even if um, there was an attempt to disrupt this meeting. Um, but I think what we are seeing is that as young women and children and, and all of us are working online, that cyber violence is, is increasing dramatically. So we need to find ways to really start building out uh, cyber security and focusing on that as a big issue, especially for our kids in school. Because you imagine you're in class and it's hacked with the kind of experience we had today. It's a horrible experience for anybody. So thank you. Um, and on behalf of the, the UN and it's bro broadly all the UN agencies, there's over 17 of us uh, in the country, UNAIDS, UNICEF, UNFPA, World Health Organization, ILO, Office of Human Rights, UN Office of Drugs and Crime. I think we're many, many of us who are here. I also want to acknowledge that I think we have with us some, um, some members. I think the EU might be with us and uh, a few other of the diplomatic community who are also wanting to support the work on gender and gender equality. So thank you so much for the opportunity and the partnership. Thank you very much, Anne. And then I think I still want also to to echo what you said around cyber violence. I mean, we, women do not have safe spaces anymore. For us to be in our safe space, in that it with horrific, brutal images like that, shows that there is no space where women can really meet and engage without men bringing violence on them. But yeah, thank you that the UN Women is has managed to reconnect us, and we now are in, uh, in engaging. Uh, I'm, I'm going to ask, Marlene is with the Working Group of Disability, to also share her perspective around the, the impact of, of, of uh, COVID uh, on, on people with disabilities, but also what, what uh, interventions are they proposing that they think if these ones are implemented, they can really make an impact in the community? Marlene? Can, while she's still sorting herself, can then I ask Brenda? Brenda Matumise, who is the co-chair of the Interim Steering Committee, to make her input. Good afternoon, uh, Minister Maite Mgwane Mashabani and Deputy Minister uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity and thank you colleagues for joining in um, on a very important subject. I think my takeout from the three uh, presentations uh, are, are as follows. There has to be from today onwards, I think, in us trying to respond to the lockdown and COVID. As I was saying, my takeout. Uh,
is as follows, and I, I just want us to to find um, solutions that can have a lasting impact on the work that we we do as as different players in 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 gender equality. Um, one is is we're starting to do a proper segmentation of South African women and where you fi find them in 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 their numbers, right? So you have you have women currently who are working in in the uh, as first responders in the retail industry that we should oh, we should literally look at how best to give them support in terms of uh, PPP. PPEs, but also their safety as they travel between their homes and the and the place of work, right? It's a number of of these women who are out there in the retail environment that are at work daily, right? Who, as Minister pointed out earlier, who have left their children unattended, and and schooling is on, but no one is supervising that work for them, right? And we have ex we expect those children to be online learning, but there's no one supervising uh, those children, and then incidences of abuse uh, uh, increase. Right? So that's the first segment segment of women that I think we, we need to pay particular attention to, and look at the transport uh, that is available and to ensure the safety of these women as they uh, access their place of work, right? That they are not uh, violated us uh, in in any in any manner or any form. The second segment that what Anne touched on is the informal sector, uh, and we start to build a database of South African women who find themselves in the informal sector, and that work should be done as soon as possible so that we know what kind of response we should um, give out in, in in the next few days and few weeks coming uh, to respond to that to, to the women in the informal sector. In particular, now I want us I want you to bring this to the table. I mean if you look at women in the farms, especially the wine farms in, in the Western Cape, where some wine farms still pay workers with alcohol, it's something that we need to take up and uh, because those farms now are open to work, they can export wine uh, abroad. Uh, but they still pay their workers with alcohol and not decent uh, basic uh, uh, pay. The third category that I would like us to focus on is the women in the creative industry. You have many of these women who whose work has come to a an abrupt standstill because um, all the events had to be called off, right? They there is a, a a fund that is proposed from the Department of Arts and Culture, but that that it might prove not to be adequate. But we need to fight for them as women, because as we know how patriarchy works, is that if you are not at the table, no one is going to speak on your behalf. And I think, Minister, as you engage at the next joint um, level, is to keep on pushing that. Uh, that women are the biggest beneficiary of of some of these these uh, uh, package relief packages that are being proposed. If I touch on the women who most of our work, uh, we, most of the work that we've been doing is around gender-based violence and femicide, is that colleagues will be aware that we have now uh, developed the emergency uh, referral pathways that I understand has been approved by the NED joints. A referral pathway that I think will take us to a, a a point where we can effectively respond to to GBV when it arises, whether at home or a, a anywhere else, right? And I would I would urge Minister, as as you uh, do the work with with your colleagues, that we we speed up the re the regulations. And I think these are the guidelines around declaring domestic violence or GBV, in fact, uh, GBV as an essential service so that we can respond uh, quickly and effectively. At the moment, we're hamstrung with who gets the permit, who can who can move around, who can respond. And one of the, 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 the challenges that we are facing is with the GBV command center is the, the command center is, is, is working 
they, the, the, every South African is aware of that number. But when they, when they call and, and the command center responds to the, to the calls and the calls are referred to whoever they're referred to, in, in this instance, I want to talk about when the calls are referred to the police, is that we have seen a challenge with the police not responding, right? And, um, and we would like this matter to be taken up because then the victims of, of violence are not being attended to precisely because the the other leg of this of this response is not responding and is not working and if we could find a way of strengthening strengthening that leg uh, it will go a long way with making sure that they, the work that has been done at the command center is responsive uh, because the police are able to to, to respond and i think lastly uh, colleagues is around all these many relief packages that are put on the table is how, what is our approach to these uh, relief packages? And we need to formulate a position that will ensure that women are the beneficiaries of some of these uh, relief packages that are put on the table. There is a call to increase the basic, to have a basic income grant, and in fact, to look at increasing the elderly grant and maybe even the disability. I think we should uh, push for that because as we speak, I mean, you've got two weeks to go before we know whether this lockdown is lifted or not lifted, but you already have challenges of hunger and people not having access to food, but also prices going up, affordability being an issue. And I think we need to, as from today, we need to have a response on just how we lessen the burden on the many women who are finding it very difficult to survive uh, at the moment because we so we we are responding to the mental issues we are responding to physical issues we are responding to just survival and financial uh, challenges that um many uh, women who are breadwinners cannot breathe because they don't know what is going to happen to them in the next week or so lastly it's really around the work that is being done with the homeless people where you 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 have opened up um, shelters for them in, in the different provinces, but without looking at the safety aspects of those shelters that are being opened in the, for, for homeless people. And so we have had incidences of violence being reported, women being raped in, in, in those shelters. So we also then need to start to remove women from, from, from those spaces and find appropriate shelter for it. And in, in the shelter, I know, Minister, we and we we are working very hard to map out the shelter availability at the moment, right? We we have received individuals who have got either boutique hotels or they uh, they've got their 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 centres where they can make room available for 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 us to making their spaces available to use as shelters. We we're looking at that and additional shelter space is available and we will need to find ways on how that information is communicated to all for those for to all of us to know that shelter space is available in the different districts and different provinces and how people can access all of that. Thank you. We had Vuyo Masati speaking from Sawid and Afasa. I'm gonna check but Vuyo I think let's let you get, let's let you share how things are going in that space. Thank you so much. I I mean, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be in this space. The critical things that I would like to report on from a Saweed side, South African Women in Dialogue, is that as Saweed, we have been involved in particularly focusing on the indigent families. Some of you will remember that we were very much engaged in a three-year action research, which basically focused on the area of family-based interventions, where we would zoom into a given district, go to specific families within those districts, and with the training by the Kenya College during the time, Yagamama Bethakowa, who assisted us to set up, and from that, Social auxiliary workers were trained who basically 
in almost four provinces that were piloted for these, the identification of the indigent using specific methodology that identifies and assesses the vulnerability of those communities, most of whom were women-headed households. Now, coming back to now, what we managed to do after the three years was to upscale the lessons at two levels. We managed to upscale the lessons by ensuring that the training program that we did with Tanya College is actually upscaled at UNISA, where the School of Social Work built on that material, which was accredited by the Health and Welfare Center, to, as, to have a, a program, training program at UNISA from, I think, last year, if not two years ago, to sort of have the social work auxiliaries trained, and they come from any part of the continent, as UNISA is sort of continental. So that was the one part of the work. The other part of the work was to continue with the community-based initiative. And that was done through a partnership with the Women's Development Bank Trust through a program they call Zenzele. And they managed to continue with these, and they're still doing that at community level within the KZN, within the Limpopo, within a, a, a free state, where basically they continue to work at family level and specifically assisted with basic needs of getting you an ID, but taking it further in terms of ensuring that the basic needs are being met. What is critical? with this process is that we managed to take to the country a very clear process of being able to identify the, the vulnerable to account. At this point, we've got about 30,000 families that are indigent that can be accounted for. And it was through this process that we engaged with provincial departments and we engaged with the Solidarity Fund to actually present something that we can build on during this process. Because what we found before the shutdown lockdown, as soon as this process started, we appreciated the fact that we are going to hit a snag because what was expected with our work with Salga at the time was that at ward level, we should be having indigent lists so that when we are faced with such conditions, would be able to know exactly who to target where. So now we have managed to start that process with the engagement of the Solidarity Fund. But working with the provinces, it's become clear that a lot of people, I mean, three things that have already been highlighted, that the cash grants are not enough, and it is not enough to say that you've given a grant to a particular family, particularly a child-headed or teenage-headed with children that are getting those grants, they continue with hunger. And other families, in terms of the elderly, who end up looking after other family, you know, other family members. So it becomes a, 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 a cycle, a circle. So what, what we do now was to go further with because that sort of targets only a few areas to identify community-based organizations, CPOs, that operate already with ESD, that can assist in identifying, and we've been working, and thanks also to the Women's Ministry for, you know, assisting in directing us, because we are specifically identifying women who are seriously vulnerable. We've looked also included in that is the whole area of domestic work. Women who are domestic workers who have lost income because of this, and people have talked about informal sector and all the other areas. And also engaging with those in the CPOs and NGOs who are working with those in the area of sex work and how Right now, those families are also vulnerable. So we are working in terms of pulling all those lists 
sharing them with the Solidarity Fund, ensuring that we strengthen those CPOs and NGOs that are working at that level so that the food parcels that are being distributed can go directly to people that have been identified. But what is critical for us as Saweed at this point is that we are actually engaging with UN women as well to say, let us work to zoom onto the vulnerability assessment method that in a sense we can have. So basically, out of this whole process, we're going beyond COVID-19 to build on what was already started in a manner that focuses the poverty and education strategies that deal specifically with the core causes that are actually continuously making us vulnerable. So to this end, the idea is to find those like-minded people that can mm -hmm. align with us and assist us with those vulnerability testing tools and assessments. And then working with government on the other hand, so that we can all of us, particularly now COCTA, at a municipal level, ward level, to be able to get South Africa to that space where this, you know, is, is a critical intervention. But most importantly, it becomes important for us as we deal with the relief measures like food parcels to align that to sustainable livelihood measures. And that is a conversation that through the model that we talked about and the involvement, because this is about a psychosocial intervention. It is not just about a food parcel. It is actually addressing the fundamental issues that drive the, the perpetuation of poverty, including the mental state of the individuals concerned and access to resources. So we're continuing right now to focus on the food distribution and are actually trying to ensure that the psychosocial aspect of this is not lost and aligns with some of the interventions that are within the GBV and other forms that are already there. So I think at this point, I can stop at that if people want to ask questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minister, Deputy Minister and Chair and all these wonderful women. It, it gives me and that we're safe and that we're healthy. I just want to propose um, like three items because everybody has made wonderful input. And I'm going to talk about women with disability in specifically is that I would like to propose to that we develop an integrated strategy and I'm working with inclusive practices in Africa, which is a research group as well based at universities, especially UCT as well. And I'm also with the Tiger Book Hospital and the task team on disability on the advisory. So thank you for the ministry for including us as well. I would like to look at um, four items. It's the one is uh, intersectional mechanisms to render services on all levels. I would like to ask that it is cascaded down to district level. The other groups have also asked that we have interventions then from national. Thank you for national and the COVID team, but I think we need, especially for women with disabilities, that all departments need to be targeted with action plans in particular. My Stream. Our next point is to focus on emergency action actions to reach local communities, databases of health and social development to be shared to identify locations of persons with disabilities, and that it is essential that we look at the heads of NGOs and DPOs to be included in communication on practical assistance available to disseminate assistance information. And that we look at refencing, especially 
for organized or vulnerable organizations that is there already that we tap into this particular organization to help the ministry on provincial level and on uh, municipal level that we look at how we can assist persons with disabilities. I've heard the previous speaker also speak about the food parcels, but I also want to speak about the dissemination of, the, especially of medicine as well, so that we can look at the redeployment of existing therapists to health sectors and community health workers to support level action at communication. And access to transport, the major thing for food security is also access of transport. That's a worrying factor for us currently as a, com as a disability community. How do we access transport to get to certain points, to get to hospitals, to get to the specific medicines that we need just to stay alive. So we are asking actually for an integrated treatment and support strategy, Minister, Deputy Minister, so that we can really look at actions on the ground and also to ring sense where there are money available that we at least take hands with the existing communities that is on the ground, existing DPOs, NGOs that are working with persons with disabilities as per se, and that it is with on district level and municipal level from a ministerial, but I would like to urge the ministry to, on the COVID command uh, committee, that the priorities then of persons with disabilities with implementable actions being then distributed on provincial level as well. I think that the the main thing is also that we look at the technical team for disability required at the national level and then the mechanism for feedback into action plan of the national command team for COVID-19 that is that the ministry then look at the instruction to the national directors generals on, and the premiers and the provincial DGs of health, social development, basic and higher education, because we have goals that we also need that education of special needs schools, transport, labor, labor and economics. That is extremely important. We've talked about the SNMEs, but there are also women that need that particular money as the state. We have said about transport, I said about food security, I said about focus emerging, emergency action to reach local communities. A big thing for us currently is that we need to have assistance of the caregivers, that they are essential workers and they can get access and that from the ministry that they need to be said that they are essential workers that they can get to their patients to be helped. Also about the sanitation, it is important that we need to look at the communication. It is not just about sign language communication. It is also about when we look at pamphlets, how are we giving that out? When you're in a wheelchair, the person that needs to help you or if you need to use and sanitation. It's all of that packages that need to be to get to that poor community, which is usually the persons with disabilities. So it's about that access to wheelchairs, access to medicine. Yeah, and then lastly, I would like to ask to develop an integrated prevention strategy through disability inclusive technical team that we ask and that at the moment the four aspects we asked previously and i don't know whether this is practical but we have asked for a dedicated telephonic basically line a hotline for persons with disability because we have specific needs which is priority for us that is currently not being looked at when we found the hotline Thank you, Marlene. We will engage during discussions. Shahida, the, the issue of women being trapped in their homes with their children and children sometimes being left alone at home because the mother is a caregiver or she's working in, 
essential services, children being left with the perpetrators. Can can you give us your input your around issues on, on children at this time of, of COVID-19 and, and the lockdown? Thank you. Good afternoon to the Minister, Deputy Minister and Chair and all valued colleagues and associates. So something that we've been thinking about is the violence against children, which is a hidden crisis of COVID-19. Home is supposed to be a place of hope and home is supposed to be a place of safety. But during this lockdown period, we are realizing and it's coming out or coming forward that home is actually the place of danger rather than safety where many children are locked in, trapped, immobilized and shut out from the rest of the world. We've seen numerous cases of physical abuse, sexual abuse, and I was just going through our statistics and looking at who the, the relationship between the alleged perpetrators and the victims. And it, each time it's somebody that is closely connected or related or somebody that lives within the confines of the home environment. And I think this is something that we are appealing to people out there. How can we ensure the safety of children? How can we provide child-friendly reporting mechanisms to enable children in distress to reach out for help? This has to be adapted. Having online uh, you know, safety platforms is not always practical. The logistical nightmare, if a child is trapped in, has been coerced, intimidated by the perpetrator, where they will not have access to any kind of support or recourse and where they are left to the, you know, unsupervised or in the care of somebody where the mothers have been forced to go out to work or gone out for shopping or essential, uh, you know, food supplies, etc. This actually leaves children to be further abused because they are more vulnerable and they do not have the means or the mechanisms to reach out. And I think this is of grave concern because we are seeing that, uh, you know, is surfacing more and more. And in, even for children who um, are living in informal settlements where the access to ablution facilities, we've had reports where children have to go outside and wait in queues, and that's where they're most vulnerable and being uh, abused by family, by friends, by cousins. Uh, this is a pattern that we are seeing. So the harsh reality of the environment as, as well, the, the lack of infrastructure and the deprivation that they are facing makes them susceptible to, the, you know, being victims or being subjected to further uh, brutalization, whether it's emotional, psychological or physical and sexual abuse. But something that I want to also uh, bring to the attention, because I think uh, Madame Anne spoke to it, and I think a few other learned colleagues spoke to it, is that, that we have online support and central to maintaining children's learning, uh, you know, occupation, play. There's also the increased risk within the confines of the home to cyberbullying, risky online behavior and sexual exploitation, where we are finding your opportunistic uh, you know, groomers or pedophiles are waiting to uh, reach out to children, to, you know, lure children who are bored, who are, you know, do not have enough to do during this period or are frustrated and, feel, frustrated and feeling uh, lonely, isolation, because that's one of the other things we are seeing, that the, the lack of uh, social connection, it's especially their school friends, teachers that they feel safe with, and, and, and other peers or other resources that they usually have access to in terms of recreation, children are confined. And as a result, we're finding that uh, many of them have been subjected to abuse. We know that there's under-reporting because it's a few that have access to support or have been able to come forward and break the silence, have re, uh, you know, been provided with intervention, but there are many that are not in that position, and that is of grave, grave concern. What are we going to do to enable those children to reach out for help and get the help that they desperately need and deserve? Having 
spoken to some of the children that we've engaged with over this lockdown period. Um, you know, they, uh, many of them said they don't have access to cell phones, so they cannot communicate with their peers. But we talked about neighborly support and how could they reach out to their neighbors if they were in distress. Uh, you know, what kinds of sounds could they make if, because they said they all live within close proximity of their neighbors and, and, and their surrounds are very closely connected, physical connection. So some of them mentioned using a whistle, blowing a whistle so that if anybody hears a whistle, they know that that's a child in distress. Uh, and I thought that was very similar to what we had seen in India for the domestic violence issue where the project was bell bajao, meaning blow the bell or people going to ring at the doorbell when the moment you, you're hearing any domestic violence issue to disrupt it or interrupt it. But, you, you know, blowing the whistle literally and figuratively is actually asking people out there to, to reach out that this is a child in distress. You need to find out before it's too late. So I think that's one of the practical things, which is uh, a cost-effective exercise. It's something that you don't have an instruction manual or you don't need a phone, but people can, you know, reach out to a child in distress. Thank you, Shahida, for your input. I want now to ask uh, Zubi, Zubaida, because there have been issues around, now that we're dealing with the, the pandemic, also the, the pandemic, also the need for shelters has increased. And unfortunately, we do not have the, the, that type of shelter that can bring every woman and child in the same space. And minister indicated that because it's a crisis, maybe men should be the ones going to these uh, shelters. And Anne has also indicated that in Italy, the, as a country, they now are, are saying once you've got a protection order, you can go to a shelter. So as, as a national shelter movement, what can you share that can assist in also ensuring that women feel safe and maybe they are left in their homes, but we will want to hear from you. Good afternoon, esteemed colleagues and participants. So I talk on behalf of the National Shelter Movement of South Africa, but I'd just like to clarify that this does not represent homeless shelters. Mm. We're talking about gender-based violence and intimate violence in yes. this forum for the NSM. I'd like to firstly acknowledge the good and the passion that you know, all sectors of society are showing, from government to civil society to members of the community. And this has been uh, quite remarkable in the fact that, you know, for the first time, people are coming together not to work in silos, but to try and make a difference. From the point of view of the National Shelter Movement, what I'd like to say is that shelters are open and able to receive women experiencing gender-based violence. However, what we need to understand is that the lockdown actually holds women in captivity. Generally speaking, women are already isolated by their partners as a strategy um, to prevent them from seeking help. And so this is doubly so under the lockdown and creates a lot of difficulty for women to be able to leave the home. So it's not necessarily very easy for them to do so. The National Shelter Movement has been working with a number of partners over years. So we've worked with the 100 Girl Foundation and the EU and have been doing research in the past four years in six provinces um, on sheltering. So we have very specific and detailed recommendations around sheltering, which have been shared with government. Um, last year, um, the National Health Movement also engaged clients in shelters to get their viewpoints. Um, so all this is actually available. But having said that, we know that we are dealing with uncharted territory because of COVID-19. And this means that we are experiencing several challenges. Um, many of these challenges were there prior to um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. 
However, some of these challenges are really quite fundamental. The first one is that many shelters or many provinces have not received their funding for the 2020 uh, financial year. And this puts them into dire difficulty to be able to serve the women and children, from feeding them to having medication, to having PPE available, to ensure that staff are available, to make sure that transport is available in a safe way for all the, the, the staff as well as for the uh, survivors to come to the shelter. Secondly, PPEs should not be available only for adults, but also for the children in shelters. And right now, across the country, many, many provinces are saying that they do not have adequate equipment. And this becomes a concern, and it's put people into a lot of anxiety and panic. So staff have fear and anxiety around the pandemic and exposure to infection themselves. And this becomes a very big concern for us as a national shelter movement. We also, from the sheltering perspective, medical support is required for staff and especially even immunocompromised um, clients. And we know that a lot of clients that go doctors have a lot of underlying um, illnesses to deal with or otherwise chronic illnesses which are often not addressed. And now that, you know, we have the, um, the lockdown, it's really important that they're able to get their medication. Then the issue of physical and mental, uh, I mean, psychological and mental health support is really, really necessary for both staff as well as women, because in the lockdown situation in shelters, people tend to feel really frustrated and it makes it very, very difficult because they're not able to go out at all. We also know that if the lockdown continues and if the pandemic progresses, there will be an increase in uh, violence against women. Um, so this is something that we really do need to plan for. Then what I also want to point out is that the command center seems to be very stressed out uh, without adequate staff. And I think that social workers, additional social workers, need to actually be invited to, um, to, to join that, uh, the, the command center. Another problem that concerns us is that uh, the South African police we're not sure if they have a standard operating procedure because some respondents get dealt with fine and others have problems when they actually approach the police. So the NSM, uh, members of NSM have requested this kind of standard operating procedure, but they have not received anything. We also know that in some areas the police are really assisting, but in other areas, police are not necessarily helpful and making it difficult for women coming from intimate partner violence situations. Over and above that, the NSM has been involved in ensuring that a safety plan has been developed and that, you know, we work with the media to be able to send out any important information as well. Thank you. Can I now ask Prof. Uh, Olive Shistani? who is the co-chair of the interim steering committee to also make her contribution. Okay. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you so much for organizing this meeting. I think it's very interesting and brings in many different dimensions that uh, some of us may have not thought about. But I want to start by saying that um, there's something interesting in terms of the research that has been done in terms of um, the risk for COVID by gender. So far, data seems to suggest that from an immunological point of view, women seems to be more advantaged uh, than men, but it's still early on in terms of the research. Secondly, because women don't smoke as much, they seem to be protected a lot better than men. So we'll see as time goes as to whether that research actually holds or not, because most of the studies were done largely in uh, China. Secondly, 
women tend to be much more at risk because of the fact that they comprise the majority of uh, the health workforce. In 104 countries where studies were done, 67% of uh, the workforce were women. And those women often are struggling because as we heard earlier, and as we know from the television and media, that there is a shortage of personal protection equipment, the PPEs. They are in short supply, meaning that women are more likely to contract the virus because of the fact that they work in an environment like that, particularly those that work in ICU. And uh, it's going to be important that, um, first of all, as they work in those places, they mustn't work for too many hours. They must have relief. In other words, you must have more nurses that are coming in and more doctors, obviously, that are coming in and then go out so that they, they are not in there for too long. If they are in there for too long, they are more likely going to contract the virus because evidence has shown that the virus can spread up to like, you know, uh, four meters away. And they, it's been found on cell phones, on, you know, everything else that they've been using in the ICU, they found it on the shoes and everything. So they are much more at risk, you know, of getting uh, the virus. So it's important that they must have PPEs and must not spend a lot of time in the ICU. The other thing I think it might be important is that every health worker, particularly the women, must know their virus bond status. They must be tested regularly so that they know as to whether they are infected or not. Because one, they may spread the disease to other people, but at the same time, they also might be in danger because of the fact that they are you know, getting the, the, the virus. And then the other issue I wanted to mention is the question of the masks. Women are supposed to be uh, wearing masks and so do men and so do the children. So if everybody wears the mask in the household, the likelihood is that they are going to throw those masks in the basket for laundry. And the woman is the one who's supposed to be washing those masks. And she doesn't have the PPE at home to be able to ensure that she doesn't get infected. I would want to suggest that, uh, Minister, you take up this issue on the mask to say that um, they must change their, their instructions to say everyone must wash their own masks. So men must wash their own mask. Women must wash their own mask. Little girls should wash their own mask. Of course, the mother would have to try to get some gloves to be able to wash you know, masks for the babies in the household. I think that's important. The other thing I wanted to touch on is um, the fact that uh, the women may not have access to sexual and reproductive health services. We are interested in seeing how many pregnancies we are going to see after this uh, lockdown. It's going to be interesting. We ought to be watching that very closely and make sure that they get the services as soon as the lockdown is done. Of course, they are allowed to be able to go and get, you know, health care, but most people wouldn't want to go to the health facilities right now because the chances of actually contracting COVID in health facilities is quite high. You are safer at home. And then the other thing I wanted to mention about um, the care workers. Somebody mentioned issue of the care workers must be essential. Yes, they are essential workers. They are defined as such in the regulations, including essential workers, not only for gender-based violence, but I mean, essential workers for us, for disability, including for mental health. The last thing I want to say is that the issue of the lockdown, I, I know everybody is really concerned about having lockdown and the impact it actually has. We also have to look at the other side because we always have to look at things in a balanced way that if you did not have a lockdown, what would happen in so far as contracting coronavirus? The chances are greater that we'll be contracting coronavirus and many more elderly people are going to be dying in our society. So this one is a conundrum, a conundrum that we must actually um, try to address in a very balanced fashion. While we are very critical, obviously, of the fact that there is a lockdown and women are not able to, to go out, we need to find mechanisms to protect women while they are there. But there are also women that are there that are not experiencing the gender-based violence. And some of those women, we need to be working with them to work with those that are experiencing gender-based violence through telephone calls, maybe have a, a program where we encourage women 
who uh, regularly call the other women that they know they normally experience this to give them moral support you know within the homes thank you very much thank you very much prof i i've been made aware that also bafana reverend bafana kumalo is around and i think as you all know bafana has been working with men for a long time now uh, in strong gender justice and we we wanted also to in, invite him to come and share with us I mean, many a times when we say women speak out we want support but now how do they work with men who are now sitting for 21 days or 32 days at home with survivors or victims of gender violence how can they reach them what mechanism can be used to ensure that we get more men who are our partners but also engaging those that are abusive in their homes bafana can you please share with us good afternoon colleagues thanks mabatu key is uh, to reinforce the point that uh, professor shisona just made that covid at the moment at least in terms of data shows that more men are dying from it for reasons that we know poor health seeking behavior of men abuse of substances smoking excess use of alcohol making men's uh, immune system vulnerable and and obviously the implications of this is that some of these men who end up getting sick with lifestyle diseases are a burden on women who have to take care of them and our approach um, as social gender justice and uh, organizations that are working in this area we have been distributing material both to partner organizations and broadly in, on social media calling on men on a different approach to how they use the time during this lockdown calling on men to share responsibilities uh, in the home because one of the unfortunate unintended consequences of the lockdown is that women are now having to not only take care of themselves but take care of their children and take care of the men and this is not right and we are challenging men that the fact that all of us are at home we can devise a mechanism where we all allocate responsibilities so that the chores are evenly distributed and i have suggested also on this uh, chat box that we need to begin to look at a policy minister particularly around how we deal with perpetrators of violence i think it continues to be wrong that women are forced out of their homes many of whom end up with throwing cases because they are worried about their children because some shelters can't take children because of the ages and all the complications so it would help a lot if we have a policy that removes the perpetrator from the scene it doesn't leave the perpetrator not responsible for the obligations if he was paying the bond providing for the family he needs to continue to do that this is done in other countries and i think we can learn from that I think it's also important that when we look at the stimulus package that is being considered how are issues of women's vulnerability considered which needs to be prioritized it's not just about providing the amounts that are there we need to consider that when there is no food in the home when there is no water it's women who are forced to have to find means of making these things work so in the interventions that needs to be prioritized so that more resources are made available to women so that they can actually ensure that uh, there is enough food for their children uh, in the home and we we cannot do this of course without the kind of mindset that challenges things like what people are wanting to bring about now ease of access uh, to alcohol because as we all know colleagues alcohol is part of the challenge for our society in many of the issues that we are raising on this platform now we support generally as sonke the stance that government has taken on ensuring that there's no access to alcohol the fact that men are morose and are frustrated because they can't get access i don't think that should be a priority for the country now much as it is surfacing a major challenge that we are facing about the dependence on alcohol I think would be in a deeper problem because it would compound the problems that we are seeing. The levels of reported cases of violence I can assure you are going to increase it further. I think we need to do all we can to ensure that we maintain the status quo and find ways of ensuring that psychosocial support is increased. The social workers that are unemployed 
given the kind of volumes that are being experienced now in the call center can be you know brought on board so that they can provide the necessary uh, psychosocial support to those that are facing difficult situations at home we need to continue to have these engagements and challenge those perpetrators that are continuing to act in manners that is unbecoming by ensuring that the police respond and respond appropriately and remove them from the scene when there are cases that are reported. The challenge we're facing now is that we have high volumes of reported cases, but I'm not sure how many of those cases are responded to. How many of those cases have been resolved in terms of ensuring that the violence stops and does not continue? Because as we know, when men are reported to police, as soon as the police leave the house, the violence is going to start. So there needs to be some stronger mechanism of ensuring that there's a, a clear intention that this kind of behavior is not acceptable. And therefore, the police need, in this instance, to send a very, very stern message to the perpetrators. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vafana. I'm now going to go through the questions that are in here. And the questions are open to anybody, not only for the people that have uh, uh, responded, because are, we've got other experts who didn't get an opportunity to make an input, but who now can uh, contribute in the, in the dialogue. The, the, the first question comes from, uh, it's a comment from Shahana Rasul, who also supports that men should be the ones going to shelters, not women, because that in itself will, will, will assist not only now during the COVID-19, but in the future, she is saying that, remember the, the, the state during the World Cup, we had places that could start immediately so that we can utilize those that these abusive men go to. Let me go to questions first before I come to comments so that we are able to engage with the question. Or Shahana says, can you please elaborate on your psychosocial aspects, Voyo? Let me go to another question before the comments. Tando Gumed says, uh, Shahira, I'm in the school. May, may, I please, okay, may I please engage you further around issues of, of children and gender-based violence space? Another question comes from Francesca. She wants to know if could we perhaps ensure temporary subs information kiosks at crucial areas during lockdown and make them known where they are so that women and children should approach those kiosks and like depending on the the police stations as they are now, especially in areas where children will be more vulnerable. Even neighbors can be better informed to identify problems in their neighboring families. Take information centers to the people in the form of or in the form of manned kiosks. And then Shahida wants to know the command center was called today, and after 10 minutes there was music. So there is a crisis. How can the command center continue like this? If it's a matter of uh, life and death, because it cannot cope with with the calls. Can can we talk first with the questions that have been asked? And then we'll go to, to comments. The issue of the command center is coming over and over again. And I think we need a strategy on how we support the command center in ensuring that when a person calls, the calls are answered immediately. We know now that they are overwhelmed because of the, the, the crisis, but then we, they need to get more resources. And I heard my friend I was talking about unemployed social workers. So what other strategies can we utilize to support the command center as it is not coping with the calls? My brother, can I respond to the command center? Yes, Brenda. All right. So we we raised this issue with, with the command center. So under normal circumstances, we're told the command center is a 20-seater, right? And the 20-seater is always occupied. They, they have 20 individuals uh, looking after those calls. Since the announcement of the lockdown, they have reduced that because of social of physical distancing, right? So they, they are running, I think it's a 50 seater now. And they've got three shifts a day. So we will need to establish from them because the, the impression that was given to us a week ago was that they they there's always a, an individual who will respond to a call because they are running a fifteen seater and it's a three hit in a in a particular day. So I'm quite surprised that they they are not responding to the calls when they have given they gave us the assurance that 
they they have the staff because we actually wanted to to assist with giving them capacity but they gave us the assurance that they 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 have the capacity they have got people who are that they call for different uh, to, to respond to to the the, the, the demands that the, the the command center will have and if there's anyone from DSD who's on the call they can respond to that but that's what we we, we have sips and n we had a discussion around how we think also that the, the call center can be can be supported. Does any one of you want to bring that proposal on the table so that we can discuss? Hi, Mabatu. This is this is Anne. Um, I think the the first thing that has that has happened is that we have worked as a collective with uh, both government and civil society to design new referral new referral pathways for GBV in this emergency context. And uh, it includes increasing the capacity for the command centers responsive, well, not, not the immediate responsiveness, but their referral pathways to more and more uh, NGOs in the different provinces, especially where there isn't capacity. But I think that we did agree today that we're going to work together to really understand what the capacity gaps are so that we can bolster the capacity for this humanitarian crisis. We've already seen an increase of over uh, 50% from what they've told us. So I think that um, the reduced capacity of the GBV command center is very problematic and we need to think together about even those, you know, because there is, there is, there was an issue of spacing, you know, to be able to make sure that there was enough spacing as, as Brenda was sharing, but there needs to be ways in which we can think about how this work can be done even remotely during this lockdown period. And there is capacity and somebody was just sharing in the group that they have volunteers. And I'm sure we can get lots of volunteers to support the system. So we just need to think through exactly how to bolster this capacity. But there really is a commitment to support surge capacity for GBV, and it's coming from all corners. The the whole uh, notion of psychosocial basically is about relating the social factors to the person or individual's thought and behavior, the psychological you know, issues. So let me give you some very practical examples. When we go into a community, there is an assessment of, you know, the, the basic needs, what we call the basket of basic needs. And first and foremost is the whole issue of identity. You will find that one of the major reasons that are involved in people not getting IDs so that they can get cash grants is some of it is related to the issue of identity. The child has not been given a name. There's a question about the child's identity and a whole lot of psychosocial issues that are related to some of these things. Others, for instance, right now what we are seeing as far as those that are being forced to exit the social, the sexual trade are basically people who no longer now because of the lockdown are in the situation. To, to, so, so they are seriously vulnerable for different reasons. So some of those things is about not just getting a food parcel to that person, but also gets, for in this case, where we hook up with embracing dignity, to get an organization that is dealing with people who are exist, exiting sexual trade to be able to assist in dealing with those things. Now, the importance of the intervention, that's a weed had experimented with which Zendela is moving forward on our behalf with, is the fact that you've got trained community development facilitators and social auxiliary workers who basically are able to address these psychosocial issues because they go to issues of access to water, access to electricity. We're sitting now with a situation of the education system that is pushing online training, I mean education. How many of those kids have access to such? I'm talking even a television and access to electricity. The issues of access to water, which we have seen in all these dramas around the tanks. So when we talk about an, a, an overall comprehensive approach to a psychosocial model that addresses a vulnerability in a comprehensive manner, it is about that. We sit in a country where social workers have lost jobs. On the other hand, we're sitting with a crisis of mental health. So we're saying that it is not just 
about ensuring that we address the issue of food access hunger, we need to come out of this with a clearer approach that ensures that we are addressing the fundamental issues that are impoverishing our society. And we've got very specific material that we can forward to those who are interested that can read more on this. Thank you, Vuyo. One of the suggestions that came around the issue of the command center, there, there are people who really want to understand how they can assist with the command center. But the, the issue that if the command center is overwhelmed, we do have other 0800 numbers and technology should be able to provide. How can we ensure that if somebody calls the command center and it rings once or twice, then it, it immediately may be related to child line or lifeline so that we do not only focus on the command center during the lockdown, but we utilize other lines of people who are trained who will be able to provide service at the time. So unfortunately, we do not have, I mean, Connie did apologize because she was attending another meeting. And I think that is something that we maybe need to bring to the the table for social development on how we utilize all other numbers. So that when, once it rings and it, it doesn't have a response, it immediately goes to another line that has people also who are trained to, to, folk, to, to provide counseling, to provide support that are able to do that. I was going to make a, a recommendation that in the absence of social development, we will take up the issue of uh, exploring how to use other numbers to kick in in the event we are unable to link up to the most common one, which is the SOTS number. The other one is that um, on the issue of uh, men going to the shelters, we noted the comment by Brenda, but let's commit that in playing our advocacy role, we will then write through Minister to Minister of Justice and ensure that we elevate the issues or comments that have been made by civil society on the amendment of the Domestic Violence Act. Lastly, I would like to request to indicate that the South African Black Social Workers Association, I belong to their chat group, and they are indicating that they would like to come on board for retired social workers in expertise. I do believe that we can fall back to their expertise and use them. And we, we, I, we also have people like uh, uh, lawyers who want to volunteer. So I think at the end of this, we'll be able to come with a database of how we can utilize existing services and, and, and individuals who want to make a difference during this time of, of the COVID-19 in their personal capacity, but also as, as, as organizations. Any, any other input? Yeah, I see people are requesting the, the um, emergency referral pathways. Can uh, SIPS uh, just go through the comments and make sure that it's availed to, to all the people who are participating in, in this call? Can, can, can we also share, Brenda, can, can't you share also the issue of, even though we are agreeing that men are the ones that need to go to, uh, home, just to indicate what the interim steering committee has also in the meantime thought would be a, 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 an intervention around uh, guest houses and, and, and lodges. Okay. We, we have two additional shelters that we have identified. So one is in Jimiston, the other one is in observatory, right? We're now finalizing the rules of engagement with those two shelters available. We are pursuing possible guest houses that can make their places available. We have seen a request coming that there is possible uh, student accommodation that is available. Uh, it's an email that came in uh, early this afternoon. We will look into that, and if it's if it's available, it would form part of the referral system that we're talking about. So it's it, we we are looking at additional space, and that those shelters will be made available once uh, the agreements are concluded. And we are working. Uh, to ensure that by, by this Friday we have these shelters available and people can start using them uh, if, if they're needed. Well, I thought I would say something briefly around what the issue that was raised by U Dr. Buyo Masati. What one has seen during this period is that because of our understanding of the circumstances 
under which our people live, whatever we do in terms of assistance, it tends to fall into a mindset of a social wage, of handout. So uh, I'm pleased that Sawid has advanced the model and they are inviting more people on the ground because we all have to find pathways to engage our communities as they as they benefit from what they, they can be given. But also we have to look at the exit pathways for them from a skills point of view, opportunities point of view. We all know now that in, in government, different departments like the small business, department, they are working very hard on different streams, looking at what do we do beyond this period. So this model, it needs to be unpacked and really uh, simplified at a community level so that our people have a clear understanding that we don't see them as candidates for handouts as an end game in their lives. But develop at the center of it all, we want their mindset to be geared toward um, development and self uh, reliance. So we, we we will have to look at this. I think as a department, we might have to have an interaction between the two departments before we reach out to an audience like this one. But also, I like the recommendation of saying, uh, let's look at existing bodies as well, professional organizations, whether it's SAPSWA or Lawyers for Human Rights, Black Lawyers, whoever is available, because the issues we are talking about, we said women are everywhere. They are in the periphery, but their issues are important. So they, they are really all needed to assist us in terms of being close to our communities, because otherwise our people are not getting actively empowered on a daily basis, even to understand the conditions under which um, decisions are made. The la- the, also another important point which I would like us to lose, issues ra- raised, I think, by Marlene, we, we just have to flag them for now, and we still owe the sector an engagement, and they are very, very important. You, you, you will all know that we, as South Africa, we are really behind in terms of inclusive rights besides what is on paper. So this time it has become clear there's a lot more work which needs to be done uh, for us to be comfortable that we have a, a, a white paper on persons with disability and also that you are a signatory to, signature to the UN protocol. So I just wanted to make sure that we don't lose those three points. And of course, you know, all other issues that have been raised, uh, Mabato, I've been noting, we will have space uh, to to discuss uh, afterwards. Uh, on the command center, I still think maybe we are neglecting uh, to, uh, engaging uh, partners from the telecoms because besides the contribution by social development as a department earlier on, on our arrival, we were, for instance, invited by Vodacom. They had their partners from the trustees of from the, the Vodacom in the UK, and they really made serious commitments. So maybe we have been engaged the, sec, the, the, the partners from the telecoms uh, on the challenges that uh, have been raised, and we, we, we have to move swiftly to go to them so that they understand that whatever contribution they've made and government is making is they are against and the, 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 the capacity has to be enhanced as a matter of agency. Given the commitments they made to us on our arrival with the minister, I think they will respond positively. We haven't been back to them. Thank you. Thank you. There is a question here. It goes to Bafana, it goes to Shahida, and, and also to government. And the, the, the question is around Shahida, the, the, the issue of the whistle. Uh, people, the, the, says 
is it not that a little bit trickier than having access to a cell phone? Because where will a child meant to get a whistle? And the, the the police, I don't think could anybody the police here, but the issue of training of the police, they agree with Zubi that in other places the police acts well and others they don't. They are erratic, as Bafana is saying. So what systems are we putting in place to ensure that the police who are in out there in communities perform as expected and not militarize what they're doing? Chanel, government, you, why are you quick to respond on COVID-19, but when women were protesting for killing and raping, we didn't see such a an increase, okay? The issue of transport, they want to know, yes, but now we hear what you are saying and we agree with you. Now, what practices can we put in place to mitigate any possible GBV cases related to women using public transport during the lockdown? They agree with Prof with regards to men washing their own masks and the issue of where will these masks come from that people are going to wash. Then there's a question about we are going to experience, if, if we experience COVID deaths, is the Department of DSD be able to assist families who are experiencing deaths, including burials? Fidoz wants us to comment, if this is correct, that on 702, Yusufa says there are less cases of rape, crime and abuse now during lockdown. So if, if anybody has statistics that can respond on that. So any take on the question that have been asked? With the pathways, Brenda, so we will send the pathway. Yeah, so the pathways oh, will be yeah. Yes. Are there any provision by government in place for migrant women documented and undocumented? during this lockdown. Can we look into sheltering shared dwellers vulnerable not to uh, GBV, but the virus as well? That's another question. Any take on responding to this? Um, I'll take a few. Yes, Madam. Yes, Madam Shoki. On the issue of the whistle, but, but you can guide me. We used to have a memeza alarm, and I think it's something that we can explore and work with the civil society organizations in that area and the partners that used to sponsor it. At least it's an alarm that if you pull it, it triggers the sound of an alarm for you to be able to get a response from anyone around in that in that community. We can look at possible sp- uh, sponsors in this area of work and give feedback whether we're winning or not, but we are prepared to pursue it. On the issue of why COVID now and we've never done it before, I'm not so sure whether the person that sent or posed this question is aware of the immediate response by the president in the form of the emergency response action plan. Immediately when we experienced the spike on gender-based violence and the resources that were put together to ensure that something gets done, whilst the national strategic plan is being crafted and we're now at a point where the national strategic plan is approved and it's at a point of implementation for me without justifying for anything i feel there was adequate response in this area of work and there has been some kind of response as well on the part of government to enlist assistance to civil society organizations we're noting that there's been a delay in this regard to lockdown in, in terms of the disbursement of the funds. But yesterday I was informed that the that process has been unlocked as society organizations should be able to receive their funding. So on that one, I'm not so sure what else could have been done better than the response that we have already received. On whether DSD is able to assist families in terms of areas, that is a matter that we can take further to DSD, but we must be reminded that the issue of indigent areas is actually in the purview of municipality, but nothing prevents DSD to start engaging municipality to find out what plans have they put in place in the event there is death within indigent families and they are unable to bury their loved ones. Okay, I will leave it that. We do have statistics on abuse not necessarily rape, but calls that have been made to the call center by people who were calling. And I'm not so sure whether that will be adequate at this point in time, because that does not involve statistics from SATS. But what we do have is the amount of calls that were locked to the gender-based violence center to date. Thank you, Chair. Thank okay. you, uh, uh, Shoki. Uh, Brenda? Just yes. to deal with 
what has just been said uh, on the statistics on 702. I think we all need to appreciate that this lockdown has made it very has made it impossible for women to report cases of of abuse and of violence, right? Uh, because precisely because they the way the lockdown regulations were crafted uh, has sort of said to all of us stay at home and when you use that and say we must all stay at home we there's nothing else that we can do so even when i am uh, I, I suffer abuse at my home i find it very difficult and i'm scared to go out and 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 report a a, 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 a violation against me that's why there's a need uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we, the minister is, is actually making sure that we have the regulations and the guidelines amended to reflect that gender-based violence is an essential service so that the, it frees a lot of activists and NGOs that are working in this space to do their work and for women in this country to feel free to be able to report, to report cases. So we can't say when someone says on national radio that they the the numbers of of rape or abuse have decreased is because of it's precisely because there is not being reported at the moment because of the nature of the lockdown itself that has forced all of us to to be at home and and suffer in silence right so it's something that we have to work on so that it doesn't give the impression to all of us to think that we are now we now have a handle on, on violence against women and children when we don't and, and when the calls are a, a clear demonstration that there is a problem, but at the moment we don't know the nature of those calls, whether it's rape, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's sexual harassment, or whether it's, it, it's, it's any other form of, of, of violation. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, we have to work hard in ensuring that domestic violence is declared a national um, essential service uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you, Brenda. Shahida? You, you can make an input. Yes, I, I think Brenda spoke most of it already, but I just want to add it's a profound issue of silencing that we are seeing both in women and children. And the fact that there's a decrease in complaints made to the police during the lockdown period does not confirm the reduction or decrease in gender based violence. And the fact that the lockdown period where people are all, uh, you know, behind closed doors, one would expect that there would be a zero, zero percentage of reporting. And yet, as we speak, I'm speaking just within the confines of the Teddy Bear Foundation, we're already looking at 39 cases since the lockdown period of violence against children and co-occurrence of domestic violence. So that in itself says that during this period where there's supposed to be police presence, military presence, people would, you know, you would think it would be a deterrent but the reality is that it continues even behind closed doors and the, only the few cases are coming to the attention of the authorities and officials. And that is what we need to take cognizance of, that it is happening across, but we're not getting those referrals for various reasons. And as Brenda articulated, the fear, the silence that is being perpetuated because of fear of uh, being further abused. Thank you. Thank you, Shahida. But finally, there's a question to you, and I think because or, or Umruti, they want to know that the concern is around the abuse of trust by some faith leaders demanding money from women, even during these difficult situations. So what mechanisms should be put in place to deal with such abuse of power by religious leaders? Actually, that's my comment, uh, uh, Mabatu. I'm raising this because it is a, a matter that is um, current. Uh, we see lots of videos of uh, so-called men of God, you know, calling for people to give money and even going to the length of don't tell your husband a scenario, which... But, but Fana, what, what I was asking, uh, um, now that when as, 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 a, as, as a pastor, what, what type of mechanism are you proposing that... that also can be put in place as also part of, of, of COVID? Well, I think, Mabatu, the, the challenge in, in our country is that we take too long to resolve straightforward issues. The, the commission with a long name, in fact, did a, a thorough study on this and made very interesting proposals around uh, the need for a legislation that will manage this sector. 
I, I, I cannot think of anything short of a legislation so that we can protect uh, uh, vulnerable communities. Obviously, people who want to continue to participate and give their money, it's fine, it's their issue, but this should not be done under compulsion, under threats, under um, uh, you know uh, all these other machinations that we see. So there does need to be some mechanism. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, for instance, on some interventions in Rwanda, I know with all their challenges, but they've been able to deal with this issue very speedily. And some of these issues don't arise in Rwanda currently. We may not follow other examples of Rwanda, but I think on this, it's something worth looking at. We, we need to engage further around what we definitely need that can assist us immediately with, with the abuse of power, of people's emotional emotions in them, thinking that when they save a pastor, they save God. So we, we will definitely need to engage further in, in, in communities. And as we said earlier on, we all know that women bear the brunt of everything else. Now, if they have to single, some of them is, are in single uh, household and they're giving their money to a pastor while their families are in dying need. That, that's also something that we need to engage. And we've taken a long time. I, I think coming among this pastor who's in prison, we should have acted even then because there were questions that, that have been raised then. The others are comments, but also I, I'm seeing South Africa wanting to contribute in any other way in, in community level, where, where they can make, whether it's around helpline, others around shelters, because some we receive them through SMS, others are on the on email. So uh, the for, for me, what, what we need to do, I mean, Minister, Deputy Minister, you indicated that this is not going to be the first and the last. So maybe we'll have to see the, the, the next intervention where we agreeing now with summarizing all these things and have plan of action in terms of what needs to happen first. And then from there, seeing what can be an area that needs another intervention where we bring everybody together, where we can see, yes, this is one we've agreed upon. This is how we've intervened. And here it's, it's, it's a... Uh, progress that, that is, is, is coming out. I think you, Brenda, was also in, in her input that we need to ensure that, Minister, you talk to Cabinet, talk to the NCC, that GBV must be part of the essential services. And I think this way, Minister, must make an input also there. Well, uh, good afternoon once again. Uh, I had agreed even before I went into the, the cabinet meeting that indeed the, the, the gender-based violence should become part of the essential services that must be, focus must be on it mm. because we, we, we have violated ourselves as, as a nation. We wouldn't be getting into almost a crisis of the post-Second World War carrying gender-based violence baggage like we are carrying. We are Africans, so therefore, when we say we are going home, home we mean where, let me say mother, but parents, where caregivers are. And if we are not there, we are a church where people will get service and not get their things taken because they've been prayed for and so on and so on. I think there's a whole lot of overhaul and there's a whole lot of a hardly. There's a, a lot that should to finger pointing, yes, but a lot more about what is it that we can do together. I walked in, uh, from listening to you as I know you and agreeing with you. But uh, last night when I when I finished what I was doing, I, met, I, I walked into a program of people talking about the reason that why we are no longer who we are is because we do nothing together. We don't eat together, we don't clean together, we don't worship together in whatever manner. The, even Kwachasanyam, everybody comes with their one piece and look the other way and do his own way, his own way. Even at home, someone is looking at the oven, the other one is looking at the, at the um, TV. A pan, the other one is watching TV. TV, the other one is on the microwave. So when things go wrong the way they do, we want to get solution from outside. It's going to have to come from within. But really, it should not be at the expense of women. They cannot carry this. They've said enough. It's enough. But with this, 
I did confirm that I am going to follow the people who are dealing with disaster, but we regulated this gender-based violence. It needs to be regulated. We need to move with speed so that we work together and do not make it somebody else's business. Really, I, I want to thank you but, and say that really, indeed, this should be the beginning. And we need to continue. We need to carry on. We need, we need to, to keep going. It's a heavy toll but it needs all our hands on deck. Thank you, Minister. I think yeah, the, we, we have seen a, a, a very positive input from the social sciences that they've been working with, but South Africa at, at large, people wanting to volunteer, people wanting to, to say, use us in a community level. And, and one of the things that are also coming on, on, on WhatsApp, and that I think both Brenda and, and, and the IC, SISC will look into, People want to know the benefit of the solidarity fund mm -hmm. on all what we are talking about. How do we ensure that what this fund also feeds a woman at home who doesn't have all the access of what we are talking about? Mm -hmm. So I think I think the we will we will minister have a, a, a summarized re, re, report. Mm -hmm. We will come with recommendations and and we will with the UN women come with proposals to the NCC around how they in intervene yes. through a gender lens mm. when they deal with, with COVID-19. Thank you. Mm. And any any input from you as, as we about to, uh, to close? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, first of all, the conversation has really been a, a, a good one. And, you know, I saw a comment that was in, that was sharing that Perhaps there hadn't been enough done work work done on SGBVF prior to COVID, and I want to say that despite all the efforts, and there have been many, many, many efforts, the sure. issue of GBV and gender inequality is pervasive, and yeah. we just have to figure out how we boost capacity. And I think what um, what I would like to say to to both uh, uh, minister and deputy minister is that. Um, as you go to the National Command Center, I think one of the big things that we've been discussing today, just today, was that we need to really, really think about how capacity is being utilized during this COVID uh, period, because we know that many of your technical people within the, the department, uh, within social de development and others, are, are preoccupied with dealing with the urgency of, of, of COVID and so don't have the, the time to focus entirely on GBV or on women in the informal economy as they should. And so we uh, say from the UN that, and, and, I, and I don't even speak as UN women alone, but there's many different UN agencies with us, that we, are, we stand ready to provide the te technical support that would be needed to bolster this. And I think this is the same. We see that there is so much capacity in civil society and people yeah. are calling, they're sending messages, private sector are reaching out and they're saying, how can mm -hmm. we help? How can we help? So I think the biggest mm -hmm. outcome of this for me is to create the kind of platform where everybody mm. can be involved and find a way to help. Because if people are asking mm. to help, you know, we, sh we, 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 sh we shouldn't find ourselves limited by the existing structure. In fact, in some ways, on a flip side, COVID is giving us the opportunity to fix what we were not able to fix before. Uh, out of every crisis, mm. there's an opportunity. So let's uh, mm. use that as best we can. And we stand ready to support in every way we can. But thank you so much for the opportunity to do this together. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne, as always. You really <laughs> come here, come handy at the time when you really like throw a bottle, throw our arms up in the air. <laughs> yes, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all the you and, you and women uh, family, you are our family. Mm. And to all uh, NGOs, mm. civil society organizations that really want to make this work. This is our home. Let's make it work together. Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for a very insightful afternoon. Uh, we will communicate again with regards to the way forward. But also in terms of, as we're saying, this will be the first of, 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 of many. we looking forward to another engagement, but not of, of complaints now, but of, of how we have intervened at your community level. With, with that, Minister, it's uh, yeah. almost five o'clock. We're closing the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you will get the, the report 
uh, that, that we, of this meeting. It was recorded, so we'll definitely have a report and recommendations on 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 the way forward. And and as as we're saying, you are ready with technical support. We will definitely call on you, so that we free the 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 technocrats in 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 doing what they're doing, but so that we touch at, at, at the community level. I thank you all.